Now I'm a coach. I'm going with my athletes. I've already won a medal. I've been to four or five games. You know, my athletes are there. To me, it doesn't feel nearly as big. It feels like home. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! You can do it! You can do it! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympic fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, and today I am not joined by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown, because instead we have a special episode for you. A few months ago, we started doing a lightning round set of questions with our guests, where we ask each of them the same five questions and we see how their answers vary. It's really interesting how our Team Olympic Fever members are similar, yet so very different. So we'll put out lightning round episodes from time to time. Look for future lightning rounds from your favorite guests. Also, the day this show posts is Thanksgiving Day here in the United States, so I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who listens to the show. Thank you to our contributors, Ben, Book Club Claire, and Superfan Sarah, who spend their time creating great content for our show. Thank you to our patrons and donors from throughout the year. Thank you to our Facebook, Twitter, and Insta followers and Facebook group members. Thank you also especially to my lovely co-host, Allison, whom this experience would not be the same without her. This endeavor has been an incredibly rewarding experience for us, and we are honored to be able to produce the show for you. Thank you. Next week, we'll both be back with the second half of our Kim Rohde interview. But for now, sit back and enjoy lightning rounds from Jimmy Pedro, Tessa Gobo, and John Neighbor. Thanks again for listening, and until next week, keep the flame alive. We have a little lightning round of questions that okay. we ask everyone. Where are your Olympic medals? They're in my closet in my house. They go with me to every seminar and every speech I do. I show them to all the kids. Do they like them? They love them. Yeah. But they sit in my closet at home until they're ready to go on the road again. <laughs> what What is your first memory of the Olympics? 1976, sitting in front of my, my TV set with my father, watching the Montreal Olympic Games on television. And actually, Bruce Jenner was the superstar of that Olympics. That's my first memory of the Olympic Games. Uh, what's your favorite training exercise? I like weightlifting. Just, the, just weightlifting in general. I feel good when I weightlift. Uh, what Olympic sport would you do or coach other than judo? Wrestling. And what's your favorite Olympic souvenir? It has to be my medal. <laughs> <laughs> other than your medal. Other than your medal. Did you get something good? I'm, that... I'm, I'm, I'm an Olympic junkie. I love all of my Olympic apparel. Yeah. Yes, I love wearing my Team USA gear. I, uh, I like sporting that stuff. I like wearing it. That's my favorite. My wife laughs at me because she says, you don't buy any clothes because everything I own, I get for free. You know, I got from an Olympic team, a mm-hmm. national team. Somebody gave me to try it. I just, but I like being in sportswear. So I'd have to say like, you know, my Olympic polos and sweats and mm-hmm. things like that. Oh, well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah, this was fantastic. Good. Um, Good. What do you got? Nothing. Nothing? No, yeah. I mean, I, I could go on for hours know, and hours. I I'm too, fascinated. Like... And, and at some point, I'd love to hear about, I mean, you've, you've seen so many different Olympics. You've, you've seen them as a coach. You've seen them as an athlete. You've seen them as a sponsor. You've seen them as a sponsor. So you've, you've had the full kind of 360 view then. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, did you have, you, you've gone to a bunch of different ones. When you go, is it, do they seem different or is it, I'm, I'm back on the mat and that's what I'm focused on? They seem different. Okay. As an, from an athlete, as a first time Olympian, it's, it's, you're going from, I mean, judo now has evolved. So judo has big marquee events. It does, it, and it's put on a very professional show, like in France and Japan. And, and the professional circuit is nice. Now, like the the venues are beautiful, the hotels are beautiful. There's media and everything. The 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 venues they set up are amazing. There's announcing. It it's really become a very professional sport. But back in my day, 
only the world championships had like a high level feel. Everything else felt rinky dink. Mm-hmm. But when you went to the Olympics, you're going from you know competing in your local gym to being on an Olympic stage. Yeah. So my first Olympics was like, holy shit, <laughs> this is amazing! And media's everywhere, and sponsors are everywhere, and it was you know, spectators, and it was just a buzz. So it seemed humongous to me then. Now I'm a coach. I'm going with my athletes. I've already won a medal. I've been to four or five games. You know, my athletes are there. To me, it doesn't feel nearly as big. It feels like home. Okay. You know, I'm comfortable. And even behind the scenes, it's not as big of a deal to me as it once was. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 definitely, it, when you put it in perspective, and I, when I see Travis or Kayla, and it, my perspective of it has definitely changed. And you, I mean, you're just used to it. Yeah, as a coach then, how do you help your athletes who are first timers and maybe tremendously? I had yeah, to figure I mean, everything out. I had to figure everything out for myself. We didn't have really professional coaches when I was competing. We had pickup team coaches, guys that were, "Hey, what are you doing this year? You want to go coach the team?" And they they weren't my personal coach. They didn't go on the road with me everywhere. They didn't help me develop. They were just there to be a friendly face that helped me get through the Olympics. But everything like from mental preparation and physical preparation with my dad at home or was me on the road by myself figuring everything out. Whereas, you know, and, and what, what am I going to do to cut weight? What am I going to do to warm up? What How am I going to organize my own training? And now these guys, they just show up. I do. I, I show them. This is it. This is the training we're doing. This is the warm up. Go rest. Tomorrow you're not doing this. Today you're doing that. When... I pick and choose the coach. They have good guidance. They have, you know, how to mentally prepare, how to relax their mind, how to breathe and calm their heart rate down. Like it's through experience that I've learned this stuff and I've passed it on to them, which I think has, has given them the confidence to succeed. And clearly that level of professionalism has led to our best Olympics and ever. Well, and when you get these guys from all over the country, you know, you have, you have, some athletes that came here, trained here, were with you. And Still then you do. have people, like I think Marty Malloy was from the West Coast, yep. right? And she was training mostly there, then came here right before the Olympics. Yes and no. We spend all the time on the road with her as well. So we have okay. a national staff in every tournament Marty goes to. So she may use San Jose as her home base, okay. to train as her home base because she's going to school there. Yeah. But we have nationally scheduled training camps where she's out here two or three times every year working with us. When we're in Hungary or we're in Austria or we're in Germany or in Japan, me or my father is with her every single competition and every single training camp. So she gets access to us, you know, six six months out of the year. So you know them. It's not absolutely. Like, I'm, no. Suddenly, I've got this person. I've got to figure out what their style is. We have is a really strong relationship with the whole national team because we're the national coaches traveling to all their events, studying all the videos with them, watching them win or lose against everybody. And, and helping them strategize okay. and knowing all their judo, we know their idiosyncrasies, we know what how to motivate them. There's a personal connection to Marty. There's a personal connection to all of the Nat, Angie Delgado now, and like we have connections to them that are very strong because we've worked with them for so many years. Yeah, okay. This is not just Joe. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm going to help you this week. You know, let's, <laughs> what what do you do again? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. It's it's but but it's. Since I've left the coaching scene mm-hmm. and haven't been on the road for the last two years, our national staff doesn't have that consistency right now. Okay. We're not, we don't have a national coach that's on the road full time. Why? Because there's no paid position. Okay. We did it because these were we had a relationship with all these people for 10 years. They sacrificed their love, lives and came and lived here. So we felt an obligation to go on the road and help them. Yeah, but we right. weren't paid for it. And so now without a national paid staff, they have to take volunteers when they can, but there's no consistency to our coaching in this country right now, which is why, one of the reasons why we're not having success. Yeah, yeah. That's why I said until they professionalize the sport, it can't succeed. Interesting. We have a little lightning round that we try to ask everybody. Oh, okay. Um, I know, where is your medal? I keep it in that little baggie that you saw uh, behind my couch. Okay. Slash sort of under the couch. Although, yeah, 
<laughs> I guess I kind of keep it there for safekeeping, but yeah. Do you like well when you sit on the couch? Do you go? I know my medals under there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think about it. It just lives there. And I sort of have it peeking out, so whenever I come home, I see that it's there. But yeah. It's like, oh, look what's up. Oh, it's my medal. Do you want to see? Yeah, <laughs> it's just hanging out down here. Yeah. What other sport? What, what other, other sport, sport would, would you, you do? do? Oh. If you could go to the Olympics in another sport. I mean, roller derby. No, I think <laughs> I do really love roller derby. I think that has been a great way for me to transition out of rowing, still having that team that team mentality, and I needed that. I think in terms of sports that I think are, like, really cool, it would definitely be a winter sport. I think, I think in terms of what my body is structured to do, it would probably be Nordic skiing. But in terms of just fun, cool sports, like figure skating for sure, which I'm not structured to do. You're a little tall for a trip. Yeah, so. there's there's <laughs> nothing about my body that like it's like oh, figure skating. How, how many Alina Zagitovas would equal in height? <laughs> yeah, one, one. three. I don't know. <laughs> so there's the sport that I'd be good at, and the sport that I would fantasize about. Earliest Olympic memory. We used to watch, my mom and my brother and I used to watch when I was probably six, I remember, 1996. Yeah, so we watched, we would watch then as I got older and as the Olympics became more of a reality for me. Like I started, I think when I was about 16, I started thinking about it and I stopped watching. I was just like, really? yeah, I was like, it's too much. I can't. I just like that was how I dealt with it in my brain. And I watched some of the Winter Olympics now, so I can like get back into it, but there was a long period where I wasn't watching it. It was just sort of the dream. And that was it. But yeah, my earliest Olympic memory was watching the T V with my mom and my brother. So Will you watch Tokyo? Yeah. For sure. I I still care about a lot of people on that team. Uh there's a lot that I don't know. Because mm-hmm. they came in after I had been gone, but I know the work that it takes, and I definitely, I'll definitely watch. I watch the world championships now. For yeah, rowing. it's not, it's not particularly easy to watch. Mm-hmm. Not mentally, just in terms of like access to it. I'll be like Google and NBC and like trying to watch stuff after it happens. But yeah, so that's my earliest Olympic memory. So we were watching, I guess, the original. Tessa Gobo Day. Was yeah, we watched show? a lot of news clips. We watched a lot of news clips. <laughs> and there was this one moment where this little girl comes up to you and you showed her the medal. And I said to Jill, that's going to be this little girl's first Olympic memory. Oh, I hope you. so. I think New Hampshire hasn't had a lot of summer gold medalists. Right. And where... I don't think I do particularly well with the media. It's just a struggle for me. I think that it was really important that when somebody, a man, a news reporter from New Hampshire was like, we need to make this a bigger deal. And he organized that whole entire day. And I just talked with kids for the most part. And that was really, that was really cool. And I think each Olympian sort of has to pick Not Some Olympians just, it becomes their life, right? Mm -hmm. They are able to talk and they really enjoy it and they're good at it. I enjoy talking to high school students and kids and I was like, that's going to be who I talk to. So I I hope they all had as good of a day as I did. We have to go back and see this little girl's face. (laughs) I've seen that video. They did a great job. Oh my God. Her whole face was just like... Yeah, it was, it was cool. It was it was a really exciting. I'm I'm real grateful for that reporter being like, "You should do this," and he must have thought I was such a brat because I was really scared of. I public speaking was a very nerve wracking thing, and he called me and he's like, "So we're gonna have you talk to Concord Middle School," and I'm like, "Great, I love middle schoolers. They're awesome." He's like, "It's 300 kids," and I was like, "No, I will not talk to that many people at once." And then I get there and it's fine. It was totally fine. I did my spiel the same way I do it with like 30 students. And then they all got in line and they all got to hold the medal. And my brother was there. And um, it was just a really, it was a really, and my mom and dad were there. And it was just a really exciting thing because I think 
the families and the significant others of athletes sort of go unnoticed. They definitely, this is like completely off the question. Uh, they, <laughs> we love off the question. Are you kidding? <laughs> they definitely put so much into making somebody they care about dreams happen. So it was really exciting to have my brother and my mom and my dad there for that day because I think my mom told me a year or two ago or like right after that she had organized her work schedule around my practice and nap time. And I'm like, bless your heart, mom. Like, of course you did that. How could I not realize that you did that in terms of like when I'm able to talk to you? So it's just like stuff like that. And Hank was here for a year and he came and visited me probably like once a month in New Jersey. And that's like no joke of a drive. And so I think, yeah, there were a lot of people that made this gold medal happen. So it's important to take it back to New Hampshire. Besides the medal, what's your favorite souvenir? What is my favorite souvenir? They had these, I love a good blanket. And they gave us these comforters that were really, they were really cool. And we were able to bring them back with us. And they had all of the symbols that they showed like at the bottom oh, yeah. of the screen, like yeah. on it, like a printed thing. So I had this comforter that I really love. A lot of the USA USA gear I, I love, and I don't wear that often because I want to have it forever, but Nike and Ralph Lauren did really well with that. I'm trying to think of other really great, probably the comforter that the Olympic, I don't, I'm assuming it's the Olympic Village that was responsible for that. But That's really cool that, that you got to take that. Did you get to do opening and closing ceremony? We did not do opening. It too was much, too, too close, close, too close to race day, which shocks a lot of people. But I'm like, why are we there? You know, like, of course, we didn't do opening, which was sad. Um, but at the same time, I know it's Giselle's last walk. Giselle's last walk. <laughs> <laughs> I have opinions. I heard she's like, she was really into that. It was yeah. the thing. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I realized just now that I haven't watched the opening ceremony. So maybe that's oh, what wow. I do that tonight. But closing. I did do closing. That was very exciting. So you but, stayed the whole time. Yeah. We, which I found out some countries send their athletes home if they don't medal. Um, oh, wow. USA doesn't do that. Thank God. Um, but yeah, we stayed the whole time. It was really, it was crazy. You go from like having, we were, I think we got there two weeks in advance. You get there pretty far in okay. advance to adjust. And you go from like living such a regimented schedule to just being free. It was really weird. But so we stayed the whole time. The closing ceremony, it rained. It was, it was overwhelming. It, there were so many athletes. It was such a crazy cool experience. But it was also just, it was so many people. And at the end, they had that big carnival. I guess I don't know yeah. how else to explain it. And me and my good friend, uh, were trying to get out of there and we couldn't and we we're just like stuck in this carnival and it was like really cool, but also very unnerving because it's like, what is happening? So I think, and that's like on top of like all of those emotions you already have and then you're just like stuck in this carnival and you're like, how am I going to get out of here? But it was very cool. So I'm excited to see what Tokyo does. I'm excited. They're cool to watch now. It's nice to be able to watch them again. Okay, lightning round. This is our. This is my favorite part. So. Okay. Where are your medals now? Uh, safe deposit box. Okay. Um, With one exception, I keep one handy to show off to little kids. Okay. What's your first memory of the Olympics? Opening ceremonies. No, I can go even earlier than that. Uh, in the Olympic Village, uh, the, the women's team arrived after the men's team did, and I was pleased to welcome them like a big brother would welcome a young sister joining, joining the team, and we got to carry their luggage up, up to their rooms. Nice. And then what is your first memory, like, as a person of, like, what's the first Olympics you remember? Might be 72, Mark Spitz swimming in, in Munich. Uh, I did not follow the games because I wasn't a swimmer until uh, 1969. So uh, that would be it, Mark Spitz, Munich. Okay. Uh, when when you were uh, training, what was your favorite training exercise? Uh, I like something called the accelerometer. 
we would from a thousand meters and look at the clock at the 800 meter time and, and get our time, our split time. Take a minute break and then swim an 800 meter race, beating the prior 800 meter split. Looking at the clock at 600 meters to get a new split. So the, as the distances got shorter, the tempo got faster, and it, it gave me a real sense of control in what it was I was doing in workout. Also, workout was a wonderfully social environment. It's not swim for two hours and get out. It's do a lot of two-minute swims with a lot of 30-second breaks. So people will tell jokes in installments. And you can't wait to hear the end of the joke, so you swim the next set real fast so you get to the wall and hear the end of the joke. That's the kind of environment I was raised in, and it was delightful. This is my favorite question. What Olympic sport would you do or coach besides swimming? Oh, boy. Uh, I think had I not been a swimmer, I would have been a rower. I love the teamwork. I love the the the, uh, the mechanics of the sport. And I love the fact that it's, uh, it's a noble sport because nobody is – uh, nobody is a superstar. Everybody has to work as a team. And in fact, the best rowers have to back off a little bit so they don't over row the boat and over row their weaker teammates. So it's the only Olympic sport where the, the best literally choose to be noble and, and um, unrecognized. So that'd be the, the one I'd do as an athlete. If I were to be a coach, I think I might be a swim coach. But if not a swim coach, oh gosh, water polo maybe? I don't know. I never thought of it. You can't get away from the water, can you? I love the water. <laughs> and then what's your favorite uh, Olympic souvenir that you have from any of the games that you've been to? Now, at this point in my life, I think Olympic torches are, to me, what symbolize the games. And I have. I own seven torches. I've carried four of them. I, I bought the other three. To me, the, the ideals of the Olympic movement matter more than the gold medals. And the ideals are sportsmanship, fair play, respect. And those ideals are what are heralded by the Olympic flame. So the opportunity to carry the torch in four different Olympic relays, those, those are the, the keepsakes that I treasure more than anything. That's awesome. Excellent. I, I also like Olympic pins. And if you go to an Olympic Winter Games, they always occur over – the first two weeks of February. So February 14 always occurs during the Winter Olympics, and somebody always releases a Valentine's Day pin with a nice heart on it. So if you get an Olympic pin with a Valentine's heart on it when on Valentine's Day, those to me are real, real special keepsakes, which, of course, go directly to my wife. Because you're smart. Because I'm smart. <laughs> Stay in touch. Email us at olymfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olympfever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. Thank you.